I think that's working. Cool. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I know a lot of you have classes and all that, and uh, some of you even have like co-op jobs and that. Thank you again for joining. So uh, today the presentation is on uh, machine learning, as you probably already guessed, and um, it is being done by uh, Corbett AI, which, uh, if you don't know, uh, is is a company that specializes in data sciences, and uh, we have uh, one of their very own data sciences, uh, Sabina. Uh, if you wanna say hi, and uh, yeah, and. I will pass over the mic to Huda, who is also representing Corbett today, and uh, she'll fill you guys in on what's going on today. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yes? Okay, perfect. So, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this workshop on the essentials and applications of machine learning with um, an emphasis on supervised learning. A little introduction, um, Sat already kind of introduced uh, me and Sabina and uh, Corbett, but uh, I am uh, Huda Hafez, the community manager at Corbett. It is a, uh, or an AI powered platform that teaches AI and data science. Um, and I'm joining you here today with our data scientist, uh, Sabina Elkins. Uh, this workshop will be split into two parts. The first part will cover uh, elements of machine learning um, and, of course, uh, supervised learning. And the second part will be an introduction to the Corbett platform, which we will uh, later use to uh, demonstrate some supervised learning exercises that you guys can solve with us. Um, and obviously, you don't have to be knowledgeable in any of these uh, topics. Uh, that is why we're here. It's going to be an introduction, and we'll kind of like guide you through it. Uh, we will have a question period after each section of the workshop where uh, you will be able to ask whatever questions you may have surrounding the topics uh, that we present or that Sabina presents and uh, or the Corbett platform in general. Um, and a quick note just before we start, I know you guys have been given a code to access our premium content um, and just to clarify what that is. Um, apart from our usual content, which features AI powered modules on uh, data science, machine learning and deep learning, um, our premium content gives you access to um, industrialized skills um, that have been like proven to been used in like the job market today and all that, like, um, like customer segmentation, detecting credit card fraud, all that like good stuff. Um, so yeah, on that note, uh, I hope I didn't talk too much. If you guys have any questions, uh, like during the presentation or anything, just jot them down in the chat box. And after each section, I will read them out um, and uh, we will answer them. So on that note, I'll hand it off to Sabina uh, to start the workshop. All right, hi everyone. You're gonna have to give me a second to share my screen and then we'll get started. Okay, share. And then oh, chat. All right, so can someone confirm for me if they can see the first slide? Looks good. All right, so hi everybody. Um, as has been said, my name is Sabina and I'm a teacher and a content creator here at Corbett. I'm here today to talk about machine learning, which I'm sure you can gather. Um, and then after we're gonna talk about the platform together. Um, and as Huda mentioned, you can mention, you can learn on the platform machine learning data science, and also prerequisites for both of these topics. But before I get into that, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm a recent graduate from McGill University in cognitive science, which if you don't know, is basically just the study of how humans and machines think. And about four years ago, I took some introductory computer science classes and I just really fell in love with it, which started me on my path towards this career. So I'm sure many of you have similar experiences to what I've recently had and are taking similar classes to what I've taken. So in the fall, I'm gonna be joining a research group at Mila, which if you don't know, is the Montreal Institute for Artificial Intelligence. Um, and it's kind of a collaboration between different universities in Montreal. And my master's is gonna be centering on natural language processing, which is a branch of machine learning. And then I also, started working at Corbett last spring, and I've really loved my time here. And the work I do is mainly in content creation. So making teaching videos, exercises, and solutions 
Um, but it's also in data science. So assessing how well students are doing on the platform and where we can improve to help students learn. Okay, so we all know that I'm gonna be talking about machine learning today, but before I get into that, I kind of want to elaborate on why we care about machine learning. So machine learning is really sitting at the core of most of the cool innovations in the field of computer science today. And beyond that, machine learning extends into many other fields that aren't strictly based in computer science. So to elaborate this kind of broad claim, I'm going to show you a few examples that I'm sure you'll recognize um, and will excite you. So. First things first is, I think you guys have all heard about self-driving cars in the news lately. These are powered in large part by machine learning along with other robotics technologies. Um, and actually my parents recently got a car that can parallel park itself at the press of a button. So this kind of development is not only great for my personal bad parking skills, but also for the spread of machine learning technologies into today's available technology. Um, Machine learning is also very prevalent in the healthcare field. Machine learning there is being used to create advanced medical diagnostic programs. And these can help doctors to predict the presence of tumors and other diseases. And they can also help specialists uh, predicting the spread of diseases, which is particularly relevant to us these days. Um, another field in which machine learning is very used is in marketing. So here machine learning can help people perform predictive marketing based on data they have collected about their client base. And this can help to optimize an advertising budget or to help a company increase their revenue. And a final example is in the field of education. And actually a particular type of machine learning, which is uh, using intelligent tutoring systems or ITS for short. And these are, these are becoming a more widespread educational method and are getting better and better at teaching students like you. So we're gonna see one of these today in action, which is Corbett, is an intelligent tutoring system and it is dialogue based. So it acts kind of like a chat bot, but it's a tutoring system. Um, and in a minute, when we get to the demo part of the workshop, you'll get to experience learning with Corby. So what I've given you here are just a few examples of uh, the breadth of machine learning into today's technology, but I encourage you to do some Googling and see um, some use cases in a field that is really important and interesting to you because I promise you there are some use cases. Okay, so now that we kind of um, are really excited about machine learning, let's actually try to answer the question about what is machine learning. So machine learning or ML, is a branch of artificial intelligence that can build predictive functions by analyzing data. And all that really means is that ML uses mathematical and programming tools to find patterns in data and then to build mathematical functions that can help us predict something. We call these functions predictive functions or more simply models. And when we're using machine learning, there's no need to explicitly code or derive these predictive functions. The machine learning algorithm learns the function on its own, which is why it's called machine learning. So as you can see here in this handy chart, machine learning is kind of falling at the intersection of artificial intelligence and data science. And this follows very closely from the definition that we just discussed, since machine learning is using data, so data science, to learn a function, so AI. All right, so in this chart, we can see kind of the three main branches of machine learning. And depending on who you ask, there might be different categories or more categories than you see here, but I find it simplest just to look at these three to start. So the first one is supervised learning. And this branch of machine learning is basically where we have a data set with a labeled or a known variable that we're trying to predict. There are two key cases here, regression and classification. And we're gonna look more in depth at um, these three keywords in a second. So I'm just gonna explain the next two branches before we get there. So the next branch is unsupervised learning. This branch basically has a data set in the same as we had before, except it doesn't have a labeled variable to predict. Instead, unsupervised learning has the goal to discover patterns and information that was previously unknown in the data. Machines are a lot better 
this than humans are because they can process huge amounts of data and isolate trends that the human eye would miss. So this branch can be further subdivided, but we're not gonna be talking about those sections today. And then the final core branch of machine learning is reinforcement learning. So this is a little bit more different than the other two branches, but essentially in reinforcement learning, an agent with a specific end goal interacts with an environment. This agent is gonna have a function that rewards actions that lead the agent towards its end goal and then penalize actions that lead it away or don't um, attain or take steps towards attaining the end goal. And then through trial and error, the agent eventually learns what actions are most likely to lead to the end goal. So a simple example that might help you understand this a little bit better is imagine we have an intelligent agent that we're trying to teach to play tic-tac-toe. At first, when we make the agent, all it knows are the basic rules. So if it's on team X's or team O's, that it can't write over top of another uh, piece on the board, um, that it has to take turns with the other team, and it knows that its end goal is to have either three X's or three O's in a row. It's gonna play thousands of games uh, repetitively and observe the different outcomes, and hopefully it will learn some simple strategy to help it win. Um, so again, uh, reinforcement learning can be further subdivided as you see here, but we're not gonna talk about that more today. Instead, we're going to take a look at supervised learning. So as I said before, in supervised learning, we have one particular variable of interest, which we often call the target variable. And we're trying to predict this from the rest of the variables we have in our data set. And there are two key cases of supervised learning, and they are basically separated on what kind of variable the target variable is. So the first case is regression. And in regression, we're trying to predict a numeric variable, which is just a fancy way of saying we're trying to predict a number. So for instance, we might wanna predict how tall a tree will grow in meters based on factors that we know about its environment and the soil that it's growing in. Or we could try to predict the lifespan of a star based on information that we can gather from telescopes. The other kind of supervised learning is classification. Here, the target variable is a categorical variable, which basically means it's a set of discrete categories. So we want to classify all of our data points into one of these categories, which are often also called classes. So examples could be that we want to classify a tumor as either benign or malignant based on data about its size and its growth rate. Another example could be where we have more than two categories, um, a bunch of news articles, and we wanna classify them into topic categories. So, you know, sports, politics, education, et cetera. So these two cases have been a key subject of machine learning research for decades. And there are many different algorithms devoted to solving each kind of problem that you'd learn in a basic ML course. But for now, we're just gonna look at one common algorithm, which is called linear regression. You might've heard this, uh, key term before. Essentially here in this picture, you can see the blue dots of our data points and the orange line, which is our linear regression model. So we got this model from performing the linear regression algorithm. This algorithm learns a predictive function that is simply the function of a line. So y is ax plus b. Um, this line function has special variables. So y, is the prediction that our model makes for our target variable. X is the data that we have, so each data point. That's why X is a capital here, because it could be more than just one piece of information. Um, and A and B are learned coefficients that we got when we performed the linear regression algorithm. So the idea behind learning a function like this is to be able to predict the target variable for new data points. So if I learned a new value of X, um, I could say that the variable y is the point on the line that corresponds to the solution of ax plus b. This information, the, the number that I've predicted to be uh, for y, is a forecast of what the target variable will be for this data point. It's not necessarily true, but it's based on the rest of the data we can predict this outcome. So, when the linear regression algorithm is trying to learn the line that best fits the data that it's trained on, it's gonna be concerned with something like what the error bars you see here are. 
Essentially, the algorithm wants to minimize the error across all of the predictions, but it's not quite so simple as to just calculate the smallest error that you can find and kind of call it a day, because we need to make sure that our model is able to generalize to new data. So rather than just finding the line with the smallest total error, we want to balance the error among all of the points, and we need to make sure that we don't make the error too small or too large. In other words, what we want to do is make sure that we train our model to appropriately fit our data. And this basically means that we want to avoid two important cases of badly fitting our data. The first of which is overfitting, which occurs when a model learns the training data too closely, which makes it bad at generalizing to new data. So essentially, if it has you know, a collection of 10 points and it learns very closely what um, the predictive, sorry, the target variable is for each of these 10 points, when it gets a new data point, it's not gonna be able to kind of have a general trend. It's gonna end up predicting it close to which one of these uh, training values that it had. And on the other hand, we can also kind of go in the other direction and poorly fit our data, which is called underfitting. And underfitting occurs when a model cannot accurately model the training data at all, which also means it can't generalize to new data. So this would occur when we um, allow for too much error in our predictive function. Essentially, getting the best model that we can get is a bit of a balancing act between these two things. We need to make sure that there's some error because new data is gonna look different than what our model has seen during training. But we also don't want there to be too much error or our model is not gonna be able to actually predict anything useful. Okay, so that's kind of a quick overview. I'm just gonna go through the three big points that I kind of discussed. First is that machine learning, it's a branch of AI and it helps to build predictive functions by analyzing data. We also talked about supervised learning, which is a branch of machine learning. And that's where we have labeled target variables that we want to learn to predict. And finally, we have data fitting, which is how well we can approximate a target function with a machine learning model. And this basically just means that we want to find the right fit of our data to make sure that we're not over or underfitting. Um, and again, I encourage you to do some Googling about machine learning because I've just barely scratched the surface, uh, especially interesting use cases that can motivate you to learn. Um, and I think the plan now is to have a bit of a question and answer period, and then we can look at some of the resources on Corbett altogether. Yes, thank you, Sabina, so much for this very informative uh, presentation. Um, one thing that's really interesting is actually how much machine learning is now used in so many different domains. Like it's in every single, whether it's in education, whether it's in health, whether it's in um, marketing, business, and and like I saw this recently. I attended this. Um, I'm gonna geek out a little bit, but I attended this um, like this data science workshops where there were so many different companies and they were all in different fields. They were, um, some of them were in business, some of them were in marketing, some of them were in healthcare and they were all just emphasizing the need for people to be knowledgeable in machine learning. So that is something if it's like, if I can give you guys just one advice is focus on machine learning because it is the future, honestly, like from what I've seen. Um, but yeah, and if, um, if you guys have any questions, please jot them, jot them down in the chat box um, and I will uh, read them out um, for uh, Sabina to answer. Uh, so I'll just give that a few minutes uh, so that everyone has a chance uh, to like absorb and write their questions. Uh, so yeah. Yes, Justin. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you guys want to turn on your mics, uh, just go ahead. It's absolutely fine. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, it's just that I had a question about because, like, um, about machine learning. I heard that um, calculus takes a really big role, and I was wondering, like, um, if you had to like um say it in like a percentage, like how much how much would a calculus take? Uh, in machine learning, that's just that's just what I wanted to know. Um, I can give you kind of my experience. I don't know if I can give a percentage because machine learning models require a lot of calculus. They oh, also yeah, require course. a lot of linear algebra to understand right. what's going on. Um, 
I don't know if you know like how one, two, three, basically if it's the same division here as it is there, but I only got all the way to Cal uh, three and you don't have to go any further than that. I know there's Cal four and five and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I'm capable of understanding oh. and getting into oh. a master's in machine learning, right? So oh, wow. there's obviously calculus involved, but it maybe isn't something like taking a pure math degree. Mm -hmm. I see. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. If, if you guys have any questions, if you guys want to turn your mics on and ask a question, you can just uh, maybe like raise a hand. I think you can do that on Zoom, but you can raise a hand and, and, and I'll see your name. Uh, but there is a question on the chat from Ziad. Uh, what's the best type of machine learning to use in facial recognition? Well, that's a big question because facial recognition is obviously using image data, which is a heavy kind of data because all of the pixels on the screen amount to a large number of integers and then you get a huge kind of like every picture ends up being a huge amount of data. Um, I would say it's likely that the best results um, are currently being created using neural networks and deep learning. So probably um, attention mechanisms. If you have any uh, experience with neural networks, you might've heard that keyword before, but it's definitely something that is probably a few steps ahead of the things I discussed in this workshop. It's gonna, not gonna be um, simple ways of doing uh, it's not going to be linear regression. It's not going to be simple ways of doing supervised learning. It, it's likely that you'll end up having to use neural networks to get a uh, state of the art or even a pretty accurate result um, for facial recognition. Um, there's another question about good applications of machine learning in digital art. And uh, I'm not sure if I'm fully equipped to answer this question, I'm going to be honest. I don't know that much about digital art. I've seen some things about machine learning uh, being used to create pieces of art or use like um, they give them a lot of music and then the machine learning model like makes a new song essentially. But again, as I encourage you to Google throughout my presentation, you should look that up for yourself. And just Google, you know, the keyword machine learning, digital art. I'm sure you're going to find some interesting use cases. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. It's more about the Corbett system or like the website. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I signed up and uh, uh, there was this question asking me, what's the best way for me to learn? So mm -hmm. I was wondering if uh, what I'm seeing is different from what everyone, like from, like if I answered that question differently, I would see different ways of learning. So is it catering uh, the, like the material to your learning style? Is that what Corbett is trying to do here? Absolutely. So what I can tell you here is that the series of sign-up questions that you go through as right now it stands, they'll dictate the curriculum you get. So if you say, oh, I'm an expert in linear algebra, then we're not gonna give you any basic linear algebra curriculum. However, the question that you asked about in particular is currently a data collection question for us to direct our research forward. There isn't um, enough content on Corbett at the moment to provide different learning methods for all of the topics that we cover. So for now, no matter what you answer to that question, um, you'll get the same curriculum as somebody who answered the same uh, previous questions as you did. Right now, we're using that question to collect information on what kind of ways people like to learn. And using that going forward, we're going to adapt to different project-based learning styles, more programming kind of based learning, different ways that we can teach our student base. Thank you. Um, Tiffany's asking a question about my NLP thesis. So, not quite. My thesis at Mila is going to be directed towards creating variants of questions based on um, kind of being able to diversify the way that we're teaching to students who are at a more basic level or at a more advanced level. 
I'll just give you that two cents because I'm still in the project planning stages, but it's probably not going to be using directly um, information from this questionnaire in the sense that it's going to be focusing on developing one way of teaching. Sorry, getting, I don't understand your second question, Tiffany, to do spaced repetition as well without seeming too repetitive. Basically, so if you re, if you, you said you're going to do research uh, into how to uh, sort of restate the questions for different, different difficulty levels, and you could also kind of just sneak in some spaced repetition without the um, student knowing by, if you vary the questions, like if you ask them at different ask them seemingly different questions that are actually related to teaching them the same topic over time, then you can kind of do that without making them bored. <laughs> yeah. That's what I meant, sure. sorry. No, that's okay. Yeah, something along those lines. Um, it's probably going to be a little bit different than that, but that's an interesting concept that we should probably uh, jot down to look at. Um, there's one more question in the chat, which is, what are some applications in business? And do you know how widely it is used in things like business intelligence analysis. It's definitely used. Um, I talked a little bit about marketing, but similar things can be done in business for other reasons than just marketing. You can analyze your client base, um, especially, um, I don't know if you're aware, but in the finance sector, uh, machine learning is used a lot and data science is also used a lot in business. So not only machine learning, but the other thing that Corbett teaches, which is data science, because you're going to need to analyze um, kind of all the statistics that you're gathering about whether it be the stock market, you know, um, your client base, kind of uh, product needs, etc. So it's definitely widely used. Um, I'm not going to say that I'm an expert because I definitely am more in the field of computer science than I am in business, but you should take a look and see what you can find. Um, another question is, is it necessary to know about psychology besides maths for machine learning and AI? Um, I would say not necessary because it depends on what you want to look at. So if you're trying to, you know, work on some really like thought provoking AI that's like trying to mimic a human, you know, like create the singularity, you're definitely going to want to know some psychology and you're going to want to understand um, some things about the way humans think and how we can compare that to how we consider machines think. But if you want to go into computer vision or if you want to go into natural language processing, you're not necessarily going to need psychology. For something like natural language processing, you might need to have a better background in linguistics. Because machine learning kind of differs into so many different fields, you can choose a field within machine learning that you already have background in. Or you can just work on core machine learning and simply look at computer science, or you can look at an application of machine learning in a different field in which you'll need to know background in that field. Yeah, that question was actually really interesting. It's just, it got me thinking about, I think it was called Neuralink by Elon Musk. And it's <laughs> that thing that you put in your brain. I mean, honestly, I don't know if I would ever do that, but it's that thing that you put in your brain and it prevents you from dying or some weird <laughs> phenomenon like that but um yeah yeah my two cents on that is that i will let elon musk try it before i do <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah yeah um okay guys so if there is no more further questions on that we will move on to um displaying the corporate platform and what can be done on uh using the different modules uh that we provide so yeah. Um, okay, so I know you guys have the access code. Huda, do you maybe want to send the link in the chat too? Um, so that you can all either take your choice, you can follow along. Um, I'm going to share my screen in a second, or you can, you know, open it up and try for yourself. But I'm just going to go through one module with you. It's um, a rather short one, just so that we can all kind of experience the platform and go through it together. But I'm going to share my screen. Oops. All right, so can we see um, the Corbett window? Yep, okay. So I'm going to sign up, which is, that's exactly the button you'll need to click to sign up. 
Um, although you might be, if uh, Huda, you might want to send them a link to the premium landing page. Yeah, so I'm going to send a link on the chat uh, to the landing page so you guys um, can, can sign up from there and you're going to have the access code and then mm -hmm. put in the organizational uh, organization box. I think the, mm -hmm. link, the email was to business. Yeah, so when you sign up through the landing page for the premium content, you do get, uh, you get everything plus the premium content. So yeah. for normal uh, users, they only get the normal content, which yeah. we'll show you right now. But then for you guys, it's premium content as well because you joined the workshop. So uh, yeah, Tiffany, thank you for sending it over. Um, let me just see if I can give you guys the app. Okay, so she's gonna send the link, but I'll keep going here. And like um, Huda said, I'm using the kind of regular version of the platform. I'm just gonna make a little test account so we can look through it. But you guys will have a little bit more content than it is going to be shown. So I'm just gonna answer these questions kind of vaguely in order to try to get as much content as I possibly can so we can look at it all together. So I'm gonna say that I want to build advanced applications to get the most content that I can um, and that I have only a little bit of experience. And then if you deselect any of these skills, it's gonna remove some of the curriculum from your path. So if you want to just kind of be able to see everything that's available to you, I would suggest selecting everything. Um, so I'll click continue. I'm gonna give myself a bit of comfortability with all of these. This is linear algebra, calculus, probability and coding. Um, all of the coding on Corbett is Python, just so that you're aware. And then this is the question that we were discussing before. So currently we're just gathering data using this question, but hopefully later we'll be able to uh, diversify the way that we teach our students by how they prefer to learn. And I definitely prefer to learn by coding. And I'm gonna spend 10 hours a week on the platform. Okay, so I'm just gonna make a test account. So I'll do Sabina test one at Corbin. Obviously you're gonna to wanna to put in your real email, but I'm just making a Corbett test account so it doesn't end up in our statistics. Um, and I will make a password. I'm gonna sign up. Um, there's a little terms and conditions, which you should all read, but I've read it before. So I'm just gonna click yes. All right. So when you log into the Corbett platform, it looks basically like this. You have a collection of maps. Um, and these are all of the ones that you have. You have introduction to data science, etc. This is your little user. And then here we have the skills. So if you remember, I said I selected all of the skills. As I complete modules, a little progress bar is going to start going up on all of these skills until I've succeeded. And in theory, if you complete your whole curriculum on Corbett, then you'll be presented with a certificate that you can attach to your CV. Um, as kind of uh, another step to show employers or profs or whoever you're applying to um, the work that you put in on Corbett to learn about machine learning and data science. Uh, but anyways, so I selected already, you guys should go to start with the tutorial because it'll be helpful for you. But because I'm kind of controlling, I'm gonna go scroll down because I thought that there's one module in particular that we should look at because it'll be useful um, as, with respect to what I presented earlier. So you can see that there's a lot of different content on Corbett and there's a lot of things you can learn. I'm gonna scroll all the way down because I want to talk about supervised learning. So if you wanna follow along with me, this is in the machine learning overview path and it's this little head. Um, but yeah, so we're gonna click on it. So as I mentioned, this works kind of like a, it's a dialogue based intelligent tutoring system. So when we're actually in a learning unit, uh, one of those circles on the map, we're chatting back and forth with Corby. So obviously at this point we'd watch the video, but um, it's gonna be probably laggy quality if I play it for you. So what I suggest you do is when you're going through is to watch this video in its entirety and really try to focus. This one's a little bit longer, it's about 10 minutes, but the majority of videos on Corbett are about five to seven minutes. So they're easy to get through. Um, and then once I've finished watching it, I'm ready to move on and we are gonna go through some exercises all together. 
So Corby is going to give me the first one, um, and I encourage you to put in the chat any answers that you um, think, but I'll read it aloud to you. Um, so the exercise is asking, it's saying that we are given a data set of images of wildlife in Africa, and we're tasked with building a model that can identify animals in the images. It's asking me if this is a regression or a classification problem. So we covered this a little bit briefly in the talk. Does anybody have an idea? Huda, could you read the responses to me? Uh, just a quick question from Arda. Um, he's asking if, can we keep using the platform for further levels if we start using it from the beginner level? Yeah, so what you should do if you are kind of answering the questions, make sure that you include that you want to learn to the highest level, even if you're answering the questions saying that you're a beginner and you will attain the content you need to get all the way further. There ends up being kind of um, some pretty complicated stuff on the platform. Um, some complicated neural network stuff. So you can definitely get to that. Um, and in regards to the question, we actually have two answers from Tiffany and uh, Talak, and both of them say classification. Great. Um, can any of them tell me why? Uh, so Tiffany says animal. Okay. Animal or not. Animal or not. Um, well, actually, in this question, we're not trying to identify if it's an animal or not. We're trying to identify, oh, Corby's telling me I'm being too slow. Um, we're trying to identify what kind of animal it is. So in classification, we have a categorical um, target variable. And in this case, does anybody have an idea what the categorical variable might be or what some of the categories in the categorical variable might be? Uh, Tiffany's uh, is saying lions and tigers and bears. Oh, hi. Yeah, exactly. Um, so essentially, this is a classification problem where we're trying to classify all of these images into categories, whether it be, you know, whatever wildlife in Africa um, they encounter. So my answer is going to be classification because the classes are um, animals. So we'll see if Corby can understand my answer. Uh, when you're answering to Corby, I suggest writing in full sentences um, because it helps her process your answer. But also, um, you kind of need to give her a grain of salt. Sometimes she is an AI, and sometimes she can misclassify your answer. So she'll often, if she's not sure, she'll say, I'm not sure. What do you think about this? And she might be telling you to elaborate your answer. And she's pretty good at assessing um, if you're correct or incorrect, but she does make mistakes, you know, just as a human does. So anyways, she's giving me an alternative. So she's saying we're choosing between discrete valued output variables, which is the same thing as saying a categorical variable. It's not continuous, like a number scale is continuous. It's discrete. So it's category one, two, three. Anyways, okay, so she's asking me another exercise, which is where I am given a data set of text from an internet blog comment. For each text, I'm given a set of features and a value between zero to 10, indicating the happiness level of the text. So this is a number, right? And I'm tasked with building a model that can predict the happiness intensity of um, an internet comment. And does anyone have an idea if this is regression or classification? Okay, uh, Tiffany answered regression uh, and happiness on a scale of z from zero to 10. Yeah, so this is a regression problem. And the reason why it's a regression or why we know in this case that it's a regression problem is because it is a continuous target variable. It's a number target variable. So I'm gonna write regression because our target variable is a number. continuous. Great. So she's giving me a little bit of confetti, if the animation shows. Um, and she's giving me again, an alternative uh, answer. So we've got one more exercise, and then we're going to look at a coding exercise. So 
this exercise is asking me what the difference between regression and classification is. And this is kind of a pretty broad question. There's a lot of different ways you could answer it, but there's one key thing that we talked about today. Um, so does anyone have an idea as to what that might be? Well, the way I would, oh, did someone answer? Yeah, we got um, Tiffany uh, says, predict categorical versus numeric. Yeah, so the answer that I would say is the exact same thing. The difference is their type of target variable. Great. Okay. So now we get to look at a different feature on the platform, which is pretty cool. Most of the time, uh, just for your personal reference, most of the time there's more exercises than exists in this video. There's only three um, in this module because it's kind of at the beginning of a set of videos. So it's a shorter one, but the majority of the time there's around 10. Um, so expect that when you're on the platform. This one's kind of an exception to the rule. So. Um, I don't know if anyone has experience coding in Python, but um, I can walk you through it because I have a lot. So this question is giving us a little classification function, and it's saying that we've performed supervised learning on some data, and we've come up with a decision boundary that you can see in this graph over here. Sorry, it's kind of little, my laptop's a little small. Um, and so the decision boundary is in blue, and our data points are in yellow. And our goal is to classify the yellow points into class one or class zero based on if they are above the decision boundary or below the decision boundary. Um, so we're going to use this helper function outlined for us here um, above line of best fit to tell us if the point is above or below the line by giving two uh, like the x and y coordinates of the point. So if we scroll down on this left side here, we get to see the instructions. So it's kind of step by step, all the coding steps that you need to do. So the first thing it's asking us to do is to create a for loop um, for all of the inputs valued it's, uh, in this list of points. So does anyone know how to create a for loop in Python? Or does anyone know what a for loop is in Python? Uh, Angus says perhaps, Arda says yes, yes. Okay, so we're getting more yeses than noes. Okay, well, in that case, I will kind of give you the syntax, but before I'll give you a two second explanation for those who said no. A for loop, if you have a list of items, a for loop goes through the list one by one and it takes the first item and it looks at it and it does whatever you code to do. And then it continues and it takes the second item and it looks at it and it does whatever you've coded it to do. And then you move on until you get all the way to the end of the list, right? So if we wanna classify each point in our list, we're gonna use a for loop to look at each point individually um, in order to get all the way through the list and classify each of the points. I hope that was a little bit uh, easy to understand. So the syntax of a for loop, I'm gonna write for, I'll write point in, list of points. Uh, Tiffany actually has an answer. Okay, yeah. For point in list of points mm -hmm. is above. Okay, I think I, if point is above, do something. <laughs> yep. So we're going to write, so we have this for loop and we're looking at each point in our list of points. So now let's focus on if we only have the first point. And if we only have the first point, we want to know if it's above the line or below the line. So I'm going to say if, and then I'm going to call this function above line of best fit. So if above line of best fit of the point, but we need the X and Y coordinates of the point. So in our list of points, all of them are, it's a list of lists, right? So the first point is going to be the first value in the point. And then, sorry, the x-coordinate of the first point is going to be the first value in point. And then the y-coordinate of the first point is going to be the second value in point. Um, and the reason I put zero here, if you're not uh, familiar with Python, is essentially 
numbers, rather than starting counting from one, you start counting from zero when you're coding. Just, you gotta get used to that. So the Y coordinate is gonna be 0.1. So if this returns true, then what I wanna do is classify the point as class one, because we said everything above the line is gonna be in class one. So we're gonna append something to a list, but does anyone know what I'm gonna append? Uh, Tiffany says point. Um, not quite, because what we're trying to do, rather than append all the points to a list of class one and a list of class two, we want to append either the number zero or one to the list of predictions. So it would make sense if we were trying to make two lists, one that belongs to class one and one that belongs to class two. But in this case, what we're trying to do is append an indicator of what class every point is in. So if it's a love above the line of best fit, what do I want to classify it as? Uh, class one, Tiffany. Yeah, exactly. So I'll put one here, and then I'm going to write else in the case that um, it is below the line, which is what is going to be returned by this function. Um, if it's below the line, it'll return false, and we'll go to the else execution statement. And I'm going to append the opposite. Um, for right now, I'm going to put a wrong answer. So this should be zero, but I'm going to put a wrong answer so we can all look at how Corby helps you learn to code. Um, because obviously I won't be here helping you learn to code as you're going through the platform. So I'll put a wrong answer here and we'll click submit and see what Corby does. All right, so she's telling me, first of all, I'm wrong. Um, she's saying to look at the test cases to see what's wrong. So she's isolated here kind of the variable that I'm wrong in. Obviously, we only kind of are returning this list of predictions, but on other exercises on the Corbett platform, there are different things being returned. So she'll be able to isolate um, where you went wrong, what variable is not looking like what it's supposed to look like. And she's also going to show you all these test cases. So in the case that I have all of these points, this is what I should be, this is what I am returning. And you can see that I'm only returning once. So if I didn't know what my mistake was, I might say, okay, somewhere along the line, I'm not returning class zero when the point is below the line. And if instead I fix this, and now I click submit again, she's gonna run through my solution again and see if I got it right this time. So that's what we wrote it all together, we did. And you can see here, she's telling me, um, she gives my correct solution and she gives what it returns in the first test case. Um, and yeah, that's kind of it for this model. She's, or sorry, this submodule. She's gonna go through and talk to me a little bit more. Um, and then she's gonna give me a rating. So as you go through, um, the amount of points that you get kind of shows you how pr far progressed you're getting in your learning. And if we go back, we can also see, sorry, if I can scroll all the way up, that I've started, um, on some of my skills that I'm trying to learn. So here, I haven't really done much because I only did one submodule, but this, um, what is that, a hexagon, is gonna get filled up as I uh, learn the skill. Yeah. So um, that's the end of the quick demo, unless anybody has any other questions about the Corbett platform um, and what they can do with it. Uh, Tiffany is asking, how long will we have access to the Corbett platform? platform after this session. I'd like to continue using it after final exams are done at the end of April or May. Uh, Tiffany, you have, uh, since you signed up, you're going to always have um, access to the platform. It's, it's forever. Yes. <laughs> um, it's yours. It's yours. <laughs> um, yeah. So you, you're, you're always going to have access uh, since you have the access code. So, yeah. Um, so she's asking, Tiffany's also asking, is there a way to shorten the delay we see to, stimu to simulate Corbett type typing thinking after a few times it gets a bit much? Yeah, um, I actually agree with that. And that's something that we're working on and it will be implemented onto the platform soon um, to decrease the delay. But with a huge number of people on the platform, it um, ends up being kind of slow. So we're gonna get better, but we're just not there yet. Yeah, it's actually helpful. Um, like, 
finding students uh, enrolling into the platform, it, like with that type of feedback, we actually know where things are going wrong and then we'll able to, like we're able to fix it um, as fast as we can. So mm -hmm. um, that's why we need, like we want like as many students working on it as possible. Uh, Tiffany's also asking, where can we submit feedback about suggestions, Bugs at Corbett? That is a very good question. Um, I am actually gonna put an email uh, on the chat box that you guys can send uh, any bugs or issues that you find on the platform or even any questions um, that you might have, or even if you want us to kind of reformat your, your your um, curriculum, if you want to go back from point zero, or if you did something wrong with the sign up process in the beginning, um, we'll be able to fix that. So I'm going to put down the email uh, and yeah. you can send uh, all your emails to that support at corbett.ai. If you're interested also when sending an email to that email, you can include that you'd like to be um, considered for user interviews. So we conduct a lot of those checking in with students, seeing how they like the platform and talking to them face-to-face -face, or I guess computer camera <laughs> to computer camera about um, how they feel about the platform. So if you do have a lot of feedback that you'd like to share, we'd love to hear it. And you can say that you're interested in that and then you'll be contacted for the next round of user interviews. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, great, sounds good. Okay, perfect. If there aren't any Further questions, uh, let's see. Okay, so Tiffany just is saying, sometimes when I answer with a number, for example, seven, Corbett replies, this is what I would have said, seven. These answers look the same to me, so I don't know why I received this reply. Right, so in the current iteration of the Corbett Tutor on the platform, um, we have been experimenting with a new approach where Corby always gives you an alternate answer. But in cases when you're answering just a number, your answer is obviously going to be the same. If you got it right and the right answer is seven, you know, and um, Corby's trying to give you an alternate answer, but the right answer is seven, she can't really change that, you know? Um, so for questions like this, it does become kind of annoying and it's something that we need to fix. But the reason that we have this is so that Corby always gives you an alternate answer. So when you have more theory-based answers, you can kind of see a different side to the question and if it's something that you haven't seen before. But obviously the algorithm that's trying to pick a different answer is not really good when all the answers are the same. So hopefully we'll be able to improve this feature in the future, but that's why um, she's telling you, um, that, you know, here's an alternate answer, but it's the same as what you already said. Thanks, I just wanna say that explanation was really good. Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, there aren't any further questions, I think, unless you guys have any. Um, so to conclude, thank you so much for uh, joining us here today. Um, we hope you enjoyed the presentation. We hope you enjoyed uh, the demo. We hope you enjoyed the platform. Uh, please, if you do, recommend it to your friends. Um, uh, we would love to have uh, your feedback. We would love to like help students out, especially because we know it's exam time. So yeah to be of assistance mm -hmm. <laughs> um so yeah thank you guys so much uh thank you sat for having us um my friends yeah thank you thank you justin thank you everyone okay well that's it for us thank you sat for having us thank you so much you guys for joining today uh it was a really good presentation um uh, thank you for, to both Buddha and uh, sabina today um i'm personally excited to use the platform myself to learn a bit more uh yeah and uh yeah, we got a lot of good questions today, I think. So it was definitely one of the better events that I've organized this year, I would say. And it was only all thanks to you guys. Thanks. Uh, I hope we can um, yeah, continue correspondence and uh, organize events in the future as well. But um, yeah, mm -hmm. it, was, it was really fun having you guys today. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Yeah, I hope you all explore Corbett and enjoy your time learning with Corby um, and tell us if you encounter any frustrations with her because we are a, a recent startup and we're still very much trying to learn. Yeah, pretty much. And uh, the support email is right there, you guys. Uh, I hope you you got it uh, noted down somewhere. And like Spina said, if you guys have any issues, just shoot us an email and we'll respond right away. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, have a lovely afternoon, everybody.
Thank you. Bye. So, bye. Bye.